Hello friends, my name is Devin Fadul, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the very first episode of the Paid and Full podcast. My guest today is Stephen Foster. Stephen is a former software engineer who's spent the last few years exploring what seems like every nook and cranny of the creator economy. He's a writer, photographer, and YouTuber. And in this conversation, we get into all kinds of topics from his projects to his faith, from mysticism to the Roman Republic. I really enjoyed this chat with Stephen, and I hope you will too. What I was thinking, um, why don't you start with kind of tell me a bit more about what you're doing now. Tell me about the course, how mm. that's going so far. I think you finished cohort one. So talk about that. Yeah. So this year I launched my own cohort based photography course. I've been a YouTuber now for about two and a half years. I've been doing a lot of stuff on like tech and photography. I did Rite of Passage, which was a cohort based course last year. Had a lot of positive experiences there. Uh, met a gal named Alexandra Allen. I had it in my head that I would never make a course. She really encouraged me that like I could create my own cohort based course. And that would be a value to my audience that people would actually want to show up. And I was kind of hesitant, but she, uh, she's just a brilliant woman and uh, sort of convinced me to join her accelerator at the beginning of the year. Did that, launched the course. We sold out every single seat. We wanted two dozen people to go through it. We, we hit it. I hired four of my friends who are in like professional photography, visual design type stuff to help sort of lead the whole thing with me. Had a really positive experience. And now we're gearing up for a second cohort in June. So that's been very uh, exciting and kind of in a weird way, like totally changed my life. I mean, I'm like, I'm a mm. software engineer by trade. Uh, I've been slowly kind of trying to move out of that space uh, with the YouTube channel and my pro photography stuff. And then now with the course, it's kind of uh, sort of the final nail in the coffin of, uh, you know, past corporate me turning into like full-time creator me really, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's fun. What was the biggest hiccup or challenge or learning experience when going through that first cohort? We didn't really have any big hiccups. And I think a lot of that was due to the fact that uh, I'd been building, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties now. I've, I've had a professional career for about 15 years. I didn't go to college. So I've been, I've been working full-time really since I was 18, worked for lynda.com. So understanding all the pieces that go into instructional design, like when you wanted to design a course, uh, being able to draw back on some of that timeless experience, right? Like instructional design is timeless. The medium may be different, but thankfully I had Alexandra to help help out there. Um, and then uh, just hiring. Um, once we hit a certain quota of the seats sold, um, I knew I could hire uh, some of my really good friends. And that's, you know, professional network stuff. That's, you know, identifying folks who not only are absolute top notch quality in their field, but also have the instructional design finesse and the like empathy and the, the EQ to uh, be an educator and have the presence in ca on camera. Now, granted, photography, pretty much all of us have that a camera presence built in because it's part of the craft, uh, but not always. And so identifying all those things um, and knowing that they had to come together um, really ensure that we went off without a hitch. And then now it's just about some refinements that we can make to just continue to, uh, to make the course gold. But, um, you know, classic example of like just so many incredible people sort of pouring into it and knowing how to knowing how to set up the system. So you let incredible people shine. That's, um, you know, I, I'd attribute a lot of that <laughs> success mm -hmm. to, um, to that. Yeah. And you, you've got some badass um, pros in the course, right? Oh man. Three of the four folks that I brought in, my buddy, Sam, my buddy, Jesse, and my friend, Noel, um, we all go to the same church. We all live within about five minutes of each other and we've all have helped each other out over the last few years. So we've all worked uh, work together. We've borrowed lenses from each other, gone on professional shoots with each other. The final person that I brought in came, rounded it out, Elizabeth Edwards, who um, I met uh, through Rite of Passage. Uh, she lives in New York, professionally trained, professionally educated architect. And what she had been doing leading up to the course was she had been doing these breakdowns on Twitter, where she was looking at, you know, fine art from the, Rena uh, the Renaissance and um, even like all the way up to the Baroque period. And breaking down how these different artists use things like Supermoto and um, Chiaroscura. And I knew all those things because I read the Da Vinci biography, which is back here on my uh, which one? My shelf. Um, it is this one right here by Walter Isaacson. Oh, yeah. Leonardo Da Vinci, right? It's like right That's next great. to my 
in my Bibliotheca Bible set. Reading that book and understanding how da Vinci did painting changed how I thought about my photography. And so bringing Elizabeth in, I knew that like wire could be crossed and be super valuable. Um, and so I brought her in to do what she was doing for fine art and apply it to photography. It's really detailed. Like she'll just keep turning on layers, drawing on top of this like fine art, which almost feels like sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. But like, that's how you learn, right? Like she, the way she's drawing the sloping lines and showing you how lights falling off and moving and like the, the motion and the, um, and the subjects in the image and the placement and the fall off of all the backgrounds, right? Like you don't think about those things actively, um, unless you're trained to her work, teaching people how to appreciate art in that way uh, is, is really fun. And so we brought that into photography and, uh, it was just a great great group of individuals to teach this vision that we had, which is like, everyone has a camera in their pocket. Like there's not a lot of things that are unprecedented in time. And the old Ecclesiastes saying, every, there's nothing new under the sun, mm. right? It's like, well, there is one really interesting thing that's new under the sun right now in the last like 15 years is that everyone now has a camera with them. Like pretty much everyone on the planet has a camera. Mm -hmm. And when we think about storytelling, we think about like, okay, you know, in the last maybe 400 years, we've seen this like gradual rise of like literacy, especially like in the West. We've seen this like massive rise, not only of like literacy as far as like reading and writing goes, but now like with the ability in the information age to just send out information anywhere in an instant. And now like we're, I think, entering into this like sort of third wave, but now this tool's in everyone's hand, like the camera, right? Whether it's on your phone or it's, it's a, a secondary device that you purchase, what an incredible market to, to speak to, right? And then you don't have to worry about being a, a pro but like literally anything you do with your camera can amplify what you're, what you actually care about doing in your professional life, your personal life, anything, because it's a storytelling device ultimately. And that was sort of the, the pitch that we made with the course. And uh, it really resonated with people. I mean, we had folks come join our free workshops from every single continent. We had this amazing cohort of folks from all over the world. So we we really found, you know, I think a timeless, a timeless truth there that like imagery is storytelling. There is a new tool on the block. And learning it is worthwhile. Yeah, that resonates so much with me, obviously. You know my background like as an amateur, capital A amateur photographer. Yes. Okay. My mother-in-law, I'm trying to coach her on the basics of just using mm. her phone. Like she loves to Zoom. And I finally yeah. sat her down on Easter. I'm like, listen, okay. So I'll be a little bit disappointed if she next time takes a photo and tries to Zoom in. Tell me, A, yeah. tell me where I'm wrong. And B, what I mm -hmm. want to know is what's like a, a tip or trick that will solve a lot of problems for like most people that take photos which is you know pretty much everybody's mm, yeah of course well i so this goes back to an experience that i had and you know, I, I got my career started in the apple store and uh it was such a great experience 15 years ago to to be serving the general public at a time where like i think the first iphone had just come out you know within a year of my employment there i remember watching some of these folks that were probably in their 50s 60s maybe 70s trying to use an iphone for the first time and, you know, taking pictures wasn't a big thing back then. It was, a, it was a tough camera to take a photo on because it wasn't, you know, like what we have now. But what I realized is like, oh, there's a lot of folks that, you know, for them, they can't compose the shot when it's that small, right? Like for them, what they're trying to do is they're trying to compose their subject and clearly see their subject. And like, I know my folks who are deep into their 60s now. They, uh, you know, they have like the text turned all the way up as like big as it can possibly get on their phone. Right. So I get it. Right. Like, obviously, yeah, when you when you zoom in and do the digital zoom, it degrades the quality of the image. But for that person, they are trying to capture the memory. And that's probably the only way that they can actually compose the shot that they they're trying to see. Uh, so that's probably something else. Uh, I don't really know how to like. Uh, remedy that beyond like having some empathy for it maybe but one like great thing that anyone can do on their phone to take a better photo it actually has nothing to even do with your phone it's really to think about light as light falls over your subject and you've identified your subject you maybe have identified your scene and you go okay i want to capture uh this subject this person maybe or kids outside playing in the yard you know and kids are i know i have an eight month old and they're starting to move a ton it's hard to like lock them down a lot of it's just orientation right so if i'm outside little things of like hey it's the afternoon the sun's already moving west i'm gonna maybe move at a 45 to 90 degree angle from where the sun is and where my subject is right so now i have some nice light falling across the profile of my subject it, what that does is that allows the light and shadows to adequately shape 
your subject, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you're if you're shooting someone where like the light's straight on them, they're going to be squinting. It's not going to be that great. If you shoot it backlit with the shadows, right? Now you can't even see your subject. If you move to that offset 45 to 90 degrees ish, roughly from where your main light source is to your subject, you'll take a better photo every time. So if I'm taking the photo, I don't want to be between the sun and my kid, right? I also don't want my kid right. to be between me and the sun. You want right. the sun to be somewhere, yeah. right? Like you said, in that 45 to 90 degree. Okay. Yeah. Don't yeah. cause an eclipse of either kind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. A child okay. eclipse or a parent eclipse. Yeah, um, that's a great way to think about it. Yeah, it's probably a dumb question. What do you think about golden hour? Is it is it properly rated? Is it overrated? It it really does come back to like how are you going to light your subject, right? Like I know a ton of people have taken photos of golden hour, but they're shooting directly into where the sun is and everything is blown out and you have no detail. It, it it's it's almost counterintuitive, right? Because you're getting all this beautiful light from the sun and you don't want to shoot into the sun. You want to actually shoot. What is the sun dropping all that golden light on top of? Mm -hmm. Is there a subject? Is there a scene or a setting and sort of kind of turning away from the light and using that light to, to capture something in the environment. That's really powerful. So I think uh, just saying, Oh, go out and take photos at golden hour can be a little misleading because what you're actually looking for is, um, is an opportunity to find a subject in that really nice light um, to tell a story. All right. I don't want to turn this into a photography podcast because I could just pepper <laughs> you with fine. questions for the next two hours. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we can always come back to it too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you mentioned you mentioned where you live. If I remember correctly, you purposely moved there from California, right? Correct. Yeah. And and you also mentioned that you live next to all these photography friends. So I'm yeah. just I'm just curious, like what happened there? Yeah. That are all from California as, as well. <laughs> yeah, I, it was 2020. The pandemic had started. Um, my wife and I were uh, living in the Bay Area. We're both originally from San Diego, uh, California area down south. I was born and raised sort of between San Diego and Tijuana. My family's Mexican. Um, spent a lot of time in Mexico and grew up right there on the border. My wife and I always wanted to move back to San Diego when... Um, the pandemic hit, we thought, all right, this is finally the time. I was in a career transition. I thought I would end up at a company that was down there that I was interviewing at. And then all of a sudden the pandemic shifted the economy and that opportunity wasn't there anymore. My wife was working at Airbnb and uh, they had mass layoffs because no one could travel. And so we kind of got freed up and we were looking at our savings going, okay, hey, there's not a lot of opportunities out there right now, but um, you know, do we want to leave California? If we left California, we could probably you know, what is maybe like a six to 12 month emergency fund maybe goes for two to three years somewhere else. And so we jumped in the car, spent two months on the road, hit every state. It feels like West of the Mississippi or almost every state West of the Mississippi. I think it was like 20 states in total. And yeah, found ourselves up here kind of on the border between Washington and Idaho. And uh, we just found a little town where we had some family and friends that invited us to come up and just took the leap with the kind of the thought that having this lower cost of living would give us this runway to sort of find out what our next chapter of our careers would look like. And for me, that meant leaning into YouTube. And then that kind of helped me discover the folks around me that were uh, in that same creative sort of non-traditional career path. It also helped us have our uh, our first son because we found it really challenging to like get settled and established anywhere in California, even though we were from California um, and we'd been busting our butts in Silicon Valley and working tech jobs for a while. And so coming up here, being able to afford more of a lifestyle that would allow us to uh, build a family and, and pursue more creative careers. Yeah, that, that's kind of uh, mixes it all up. And then we became the social distancing champions of the world. Um, going back actually to the Da Vinci biography, uh, there's a, a great moment in there where uh, Da Vinci's in Milan with one of his uh, students that he's tutoring, Francesco Melzi, and they have a pandemic that comes through Italy. And they move out into the countryside to Melzi's parents' home. And Melzi's parents set up this studio for Leonardo Da Vinci. Could you imagine Leonardo Da Vinci just showing up at your house and be like, oh, I need a place to work for the next, you know, six to nine months. Can you can you help a guy out? Right. And so that was like really encouraging because I think the the mindset even just five years ago before the pandemic was if you're not in one of these big hubs, whether it's New York or you know San Francisco, Silicon Valley area, you're not going to be connected in with like the top performers and everything. And yeah, leaning into this sort of more distributed remote creator lifestyle has allowed us to uh, tap into those types of communities that maybe didn't even really exist like five years ago. So mm -hmm. we, we were very fortunate. Yeah. Do you think you would have been able to go down this path if you would have stayed in the Bay Area or 
San Diego or would the cost <sighs> so of living have basically say. precluded then? Yeah, it's so hard to say. It felt like, at least on the trajectory that we had, it would have been, it seemed further away from us. Whereas like once everything, once all the the shoes dropped and, you know, everything fell into place at that point, it was like, oh, you know, like we could start living the life we want to live now just in another place. And, you know, living in the Bay Area, you know, the the benefit of being there about being plugged in and connected to this whole community, you know, we're not even accessing that value, even in Southern California, right? Having mm-hmm. Los Angeles an hour and a half away uh, from San Diego area, those were two big hubs. And, you know, when you can't go outside and meet people and interact and go to conferences and, uh, you know, take advantage of that, it was like, all right, well, I might as well, you know, we kind of treated it like an experiment as well. Like, you know, hey, we'll, we'll go out and we can try it for a year. And, you know, if things change, we can figure something else out. Uh, but yeah, we've ended up loving it. Are you, are you into the outdoors? Like, what are you doing up there? Skiing? Yeah. Uh, hiking? Yeah. What's, what's your jam? Oh, uh, well, I'm, we're big into uh, water sports. So we have a lake here by us, which uh, we can kind of only get out on maybe about six months out of the year if we're lucky. Mm-hmm. We love stand up paddle boarding. We love wakeboarding, wake surfing. We got some neighbors and friends with boats. I might one day make the, the poorest financial decision of all and buy a boat. Um, <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, I love being out on the water. We'd love to do more snowboarding and skiing. Unfortunately, like we've had some family stuff crop up. But yeah, there's some incredible snowboarding right up here. BC, British Columbia, and like going up to Banff and like Alberta, like all that is just just due north of us. So we have a ton of options when it comes to um, those opportunities. I, I grew up snowboarding too as a kid, um, did it for a while when I was in my 20s. Uh, a lot of it too is just also like open forest and just doing hikes, climbing mountains. We, um, I think within the first year that we were here, we hit Glacier National Park several times just hiking, climbing up and around that place. Beautiful part of the country in Montana, four or five hours away. So like very easy weekend trip, get out to one of the best, I think one of the most stunning national parks in the whole country and in the whole continent, really. I can't remember when we first chatted, I I was either just going or just got back from Mexico City. Yeah, I think you just got back. Yeah, got back. Yeah. And I was I was reflecting with you about how I love that period of history. Just endlessly Mm. fascinating to me. I had no idea the sheer kind of breadth of cultures, the different populations in the, in the city yeah. centers. I mean, there were, I, I, I think hundreds but in most people's minds, it's the Aztecs and the, and the Mayans and the Incans, right? You don't realize yeah. that there's, there's hundreds, thousands of other ones across the entire mm-hmm. region, yeah. right? I know you've studied that a little bit. Do you, do you know where your family comes from? Like oh, the, yeah. the, the language that they yeah. speak? Tell me, tell me yep. about that. Yeah. Um, my mom's, um, it's, it was awesome, you know, being Hispanic cause you're all, all the generations are sandwiched way closer together. So I grew up with my great grandparents, um, who were, uh, wow. Perpetua. I know I'm not saying that right now my Spanish tongue and my Nahuatl is like, ever since the, my son was born, I haven't been back. So like, I'm not warmed up, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're from this lake called the Pascuaro, uh, in Michoacan as far back as, you know, my, my grandmother wrote, whole letter in Spanish about, you know, the family history and everything. And we, um, we still keep a lot of those stories alive. And um, when I go back, I talk to my cousins about a lot of that stuff. Um, what it was built in like the, the mid 1500s. Um, it's, it's crazy when you go there, it looks like um, it looks like some Spanish seaside town planted in the middle of the Mexican jungle. It's, it's actually kind of, it'll take you back. I was walking actually through the, um, the house in town that my great grandparents lived in hmm. and i went to the like the cathedral where they got married and so all that stuff's really rich it's really connected i'm texting my cousins like all the time and we're like sharing photos and so we have that connection still which is really cool um and then yeah i found out about uh diego that just because it was like you know it's, it's been like 500 years now you think about that right like um you know the united states of america hasn't even hit its uh, quarter millennia, you know, basically double the time that the United States has been a country. Mexico has had contact right with the European world and been working on that integration story. Uh, And I think I, I, you know, kind of seeing down in Mexico and going like, wow, like people are really integrated to a degree and they've had this time to sort of figure out their national story and their national identity you know, we say in the United States, like, oh, we're a melting pot, but I would argue we're more of a tossed salad, you know, like the pieces haven't really mixed up together. And um, we're in Mexico. I think it's, you know, the pot's been simmering a l- little bit longer, right? And they both have their challenges and trials and stuff in history. But Mexico, all within its first 50 years of independence, had their like first 
African, uh, you know, descendant president. They had their first, you know, fully indigenous descendant president, right? And then like, you know, you think about the sort of progression of ethnic integration in the United States, and it's um, it's taken us a little bit longer to mm -hmm. um, really get to that place. And so there's a lot of lessons there, I think, that at least for me, I wanted to learn and unlock and and go, you know, hey, like more English speakers, you know, could read this stuff and see, you know, some of the pitfalls, mistakes and successes of this cultural integration, right, that's had literally double the amount of time to elapse, right? Like, what could we learn? Right. Again, no side is perfect or anything, but it was just like an interesting thought exercise. And I went down that rabbit hole mm -hmm. years ago and still enjoy going, you know, picking out pieces like that. I think that's what we were reflecting on when you, um, you know, you have this Lebanese background mm -hmm. and I was like, dude, the Lebanese are like what gave us the pastor, man. Like, <laughs> like that, there's actually like a really strong and like cool Lebanese culture that has been like integrating into, uh, Mexico and I think actually even broader like more Central America over the last like hundred years and it's been like a really cool fusion of cultures yeah yeah I mentioned uh, I'm Lebanese American my, my my father came from Lebanon yeah. but I, I don't have much of a connection to that culture I didn't grow up uh, in it all that much I had sprinklings of it for sure but um, yeah you know I didn't I didn't I I didn't and I don't have that connection curious if you had a similar experiences as me or if you were kind of part of that culture from from day one it sounds yeah. like you it sounds like it's the it's, latter right yeah it's so different you know i was having a, an awesome conversation with a, a woman that i know from rite of passage who's born and raised in china you know we're talking about this culture thing it's like it's totally different being mexican in north america and then in the united states because it's like on one hand right like I literally, I grew up not, not to Sarah Palin it, but like I could see Mexico from my house, right? <laughs> like, like, uh, but that interaction, like I had uncles, I have still to this day, I have uncles and cousins on, on both sides of the border, like right there, you know, like hmm. Tijuana and San Diego, right. Um, my, my, my grandparents, my mom's parents still live right there on the border. Like literally, like I can walk out the front door or go up on the balcony and see, you know, on a clear day, I could see the border. And so we're steeped in it. And then and the, that's the other part of it, right? Is like all that used to be part of Mexico, right? And there's like old town San Diego, right? Which was built by the Spanish, the missions, right? And so like, you can't escape that culture in mm. the American Southwest. The Spanish culture is so a part of that history, right? Like uh, this is actually a crazy stat to think about, but California has still been longer under Spanish Mexican control throughout history than it's been under control by the United States. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's a wild thing to think about, right? Like they were impressing their, you know, their architecture and their culture and their people into those places long before California became a state. So it really is like, yeah. um, there's not a, there's not a very long, like obviously what's happened in the last 150 years in California and the United States is, you know, has its own, rich stories you know that have unfolded in the last 150 years but you know as far as duration goes it's it's still very early so yeah we we're deep deep steeped in it deep steeped in it i could go on a lot of good memories talk to me if you want about your faith uh you mentioned church before yeah did you grow up catholic are you still catholic yeah i i grew up i would say orbiting around the catholic church because my that's what my grandparents were steeped in. My parents were raised in the Catholic church. My parents were more laissez-faire about it all. They were like, Hey, look, it's, I guess it's the the eighties and the nineties now, right? Like you figure out what you want to do and we'll support you as long as yeah, you're not getting into prison or whatever. I remember doing a lot of the Catholic church stuff. Uh, I remember when my great grandmother passed away, um, had some other family, um, some aunts and uncles passed away doing, you know, doing the Catholic thing, you know, as a kid. You know, I have some really good memories of it. When I think back to my my great grandmother when she passed away, the incense burning at her service that they did mm. on that mass, like I can still smell that, right? And I was a kid, you know, I was like probably 10, 11 years old. And uh, I can still remember where I sat in the pews. I know exactly who was around me. I know exactly what it smelled like. And th there's a lot of beauty to those elements, you know. Um, I ended up going more the Protestant non-denominational route kind of thing where like all my friends in junior high and high school were in some Protestant non-denominational church. Um, I played music growing up. So like I, 
I played in the worship band in high school and played a lot of Latin jazz too, uh, which was always super fun. Uh, yeah, as I progressed through my 20s, went from kind of more of just like, a, yeah, I go to church because I'm like kind of a good person and I want to be around other people that are you know somewhat similar values to like really, I think San Francisco does that to people, right? It's like mm. San Francisco will boil you down to your essence and whatever it is that's in there is, is what's coming out. And um, I came out a Spanish mystic, um, mm. you know, in, in a lot of ways, it was like I was hearing these stories about how... Um, you know, and also just living in a place that's named after Francis of Assisi, right? You know, Claire of Assisi, the county, you know, Santa Clara down south, right? In the town. I was watching all these people talk about like how, oh, we need to like treat women better and give women fair stuff. And I'm like, you erased, you know, St. Clair from the name of this place. Like, what did, what the heck are you people talking about? Mm. Right? Like, I realized that the stories that were sort of embedded in the the foundations of these places, right, were actually the answers or or in a way an answer to, I think what the culture of our time has been crying out for hmm. and um, really, yeah, really leaned into that Spanish sort of Latin mysticism. And uh, I love that stuff. I, and it's, it, I feel like it's brought me a lot of peace. I feel like it's brought me, it sounds like, it sounds even corny to say it, but like, I feel like I'm like, I'm really close to Jesus in a weird way now. Hmm. Like it doesn't even sound right. Um, but in a way that like, I actually am trying to understand the parables and their applicability to my modern life and looking at some of these things and going like, yeah, man, like, you know, what's awesome about Christianity is like for all the stuff that's happening right now with like some of the culture clashes and racial stuff, right? It's like, dude, did we forget that like not even a hundred years ago, white people were all just killing each other in Europe and here, right? Like if there's any beauty and same with like latin america right like if there's any beauty to all this is like i think this is a part you know the piece again not bulletproof as far as like our cultural implementation of human beings doing this stuff but i think in sort of this like this wisdom you know in, inside of these stories and these parables there's like a really profound connection that we can have not just like with god but each other you know i, I think about that living up here in the in the pacific northwest you know, I, I walked into a church here and, you know, I'm like, Hey, I, I believe in the same, same guy that you believe in. Right. And here, you know, up here, it's a bunch of folks who are descendant from Swedes and French people and German people. <laughs> My wife's grandparents, I guess, came to the United States up through here. Um, and they just love and accept you. Right. And I'm like, what is more powerful than that? That like a Mexican can walk into a place, you know, just imagine walking in. My wife actually lived in Uganda in Africa for a year, walking into a church in Uganda. And they're like, oh, cool. You're one of us. Like, yeah, you're part of this family, right? And you look nothing alike. You, you were literally born on the opposite ends of the planet. Like you don't even speak the same language, but somehow there's this framework that allows you to peer together and like do stuff together. I think that's profound, especially in a time where we're like, we want peace and unity and um kindness and loyalty and like uh it, it's been fun unraveling those things and like really trying to be like and battle test them you know i'm a scientist i'm a computer scientist you know by trade software engineer whatever you want to call it i have to battle test things right like i have to like write proofs and the you know, i have to have a good thesis and, and and test for it and i love bringing a veracity to that stuff and going like this is actually really good for for uh, what we uh, what we're trying to accomplish, you know, hopefully for the good of uh, you know society and humanity. So that's I guess that's where I'm at right now. Is like Spanish mystic sounds cool, right? It's like I guess maybe that's like the cool flavor of Christianity right now, um, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> uh, but it is at the end of the day, right? It's like I I really do care about that like integral part of like Jesus to the whole thing. I really do think that's like the keystone to it. And um, that's the sort of evolution of faith over the last uh, 30 some years. Do you think that this kind of philosophy, this Spanish mysticism, does it flow through into your courses? Totally. And the yeah. and, and I'm thinking of the ways that you might organize the groups or promote uh, the community and the collaboration between the students, things like that. Yeah. Just, uh, just curious. Yeah. I think I said at the end of our first cohort, you know, um, I think I love photography so much um, and writing and what I do with YouTube because it's ultimately just storytelling. And so for me, I think, you know, with the photography course, it's like, wow, 
here I am now empowering these people to tell these stories and I get to actually see a part of creation, right? Like I, we can get so small, we can end up so much in our own little world, even with the internet now, right? Where we can get fed the news that we're supposed to hear. We can, we can only see the people that we want to see, right? In our little town. And to like get a photograph from someone in North Carolina and you're just like, wow, look at this beautiful little town on the water. And that was that's all part of creation too. This whole concept of like eternal life and heaven, right? Like you're going to be stuck with a chunk of all these people for all eternity. They better have good stories, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And like, this is what I told the students is like, I think part of being able to share in each other's stories, experience those things to me, feels like tasting a bit of heaven, even when it's hard stuff and watching people move through those things, especially when it's, you know, something celebratory, someone else, recognizing beauty out in the world and capturing that and wanting to share that. Um, that to me is like, that's some divine charcuterie, man. I'm just getting a taste of like something powerful. And I think, we, I think it's hard to not feel that, you know, like even for the person who may think they're atheist, like, or secular or whatever, right. It's like, doesn't like, doesn't it feel good to like look at a beautiful photograph and let someone tell you the story about it. And like, hopefully at the bare minimum inspire you to go somewhere and do something experience that beauty for yourself you know look I, I know nothing maybe not nothing but i know next to nothing about mysticism but if i mm. were to maybe try to try to uh apply a definition i would yeah. say it's uh a recognition that there's a higher power and that maybe the best way to connect with that higher power is through creation in some way shape or form right there's like the idea of like the muse if you were to say, hey, what's mysticism? I love it. I would define I it maybe the, in those yeah. two sentences, right? But again, I know nothing. Mysticism to me, at least, and I don't know if this is uh, probably not good enough for a broad definition, but the way that I've sort of, it's unfolded for me in my life is um, this idea that like, you're just not going to get answers. And I, I heard this quote, I don't know who to attribute it to. Someone far smarter than me said that the quality of your life will be determined by the quality of your questions. And that's tough when you're a computer scientist or software engineer, or whatever you, you need to kind of have answers because you're telling a computer what to do. If you type one wrong character, it doesn't do the thing. Right. So answers are really, you know, paramount in that profession. And then you talk about faith and eternity and uh, is there a God? You don't get compile errors and notes and success codes for that stuff. It's more, um, I guess, experience for me, that mysticism of not knowing, like rather than trying to always find the answer, trying to refine the question or explore new question and kind of look at the world in that way and be like, what can I learn about the world? Right. Like igniting curiosity. What can I learn about God based on what I have? Right. Like how can I seek the veracity and be content sort of in the, in the, in the mystery, right? There's, there's that idea that like true love is mystery. That's really hard for a lot of people. Right. Like, especially today, like people don't want mystery. People want kind of like predictability. And um, there's like a false sense of security with predictability that like predictability begets predictability. But, you know, this coming from the finance world, right? Like past success is no uh, indication of future results. Right. And that's kind of like, OK, that's good. We should apply that to our faith. Right. Because like <laughs> the end of the day, all of our money says in God we trust, like Basically, our money says we can't trust our money. The world tells us we can't trust the world. God's like, okay, you can trust me. And it's like, okay, what does that mean? Hmm. <laughs> and and so for me, the, the mysticism is like, if you read Teresa of Avila, that sort of like interior castle idea where it's like, it's praying and trying to like walk through the levels of intimacy and understanding and, and sort of feeling the setbacks like we don't have this concept today really as much, but like the idea of like a parlor or like a courtyard in a house, like my, my family in Mexico, they have like a, a proper courtyard in the house. You only make it to the courtyard if you're family, right? Like you only get it into the inner circle, right? Where you're sitting down, you're sipping tequila, listening to someone play guitar and hang out. If you like get to know someone and get into that inner circle. So I think that's like the best thing I could say about mysticism is just like, I know when I talk to some English speakers, they're like, are you a druid? Right. Are you into like Wiccan stuff, whatever? And it's like, nah, it's like, this is like a whole, is a whole thing. It didn't start with me, right? Like this is, people have been doing this for hundreds, thousands of years. And it's just, I guess, yeah, be content with 
the questioning of it all, the experience of it all. There's a contemplative component to it. I think that's what like my bio on Twitter says, like Mexican American contemplative creative. And the mm-hmm. contemplative one, people seem to really have a hard part with that, right? It's like, what the heck is a contemplative, right? Like Mexican American, I get that creative, okay, sort of thing, sure. But uh, I'm like, yeah, it's con contemple, right? Like I'm with temple, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm acknowledging the fact that like I'm carrying around and I forget who says the thing, right? Like we're not uh, humans having spiritual experiences or spirits having a human experience. And mm-hmm. that's like, uh, you know, the cone temple idea, right? Like, oh, I'm with temple, right? Like, am I addressing myself as a, as a spiritual thing first, right? And a, and a fleshy body second, right? It's that alignment of um, doing that inner work, um, intending to that sort of like inner temple, inner garden, because man, I think in, in our modern culture, we can get so divorced from the idea that we even have, you know, those things to tend to in ourselves, right? Until it becomes too late, too overwhelming, too crazy, too chaotic and insane. I think that's a big part of it too. And I feel like that's the whole point of being a mystic, right? You're like, <laughs> Webster's got a definition for it, but I don't know if it encompasses everything that I'm trying to get at. So yeah, going to the Bible, reading what Jesus says in like the Beatitudes, right? Like Matthew uh, six through eight, I believe it is. It's all really mystical stuff, like really mystical stuff. James is another great book where it's like on first pass, it sounds really legalistic, but you really start thinking about it. You're like, what does it mean that true religion is caring for widows and orphans, right? I thought religion's what I do when I go to church. And like, what do you mean that like actually religion isn't about even doing like the Sunday thing. It's like, what does that even mean? Right. On um, the Bible, especially like I, I, even the old Testament and Testament, right. It's very mystical when you start actually asking some questions about it. Right. And you start like going like, wait, what the, like, did they actually mean that? And it's like, yeah, I've read it in the Latin. Like that's actually what they're trying to say. It, it almost sounds like it shouldn't make sense, but like, that's kind of the point. We're supposed to kind of like have to wrestle with that stuff. Like, what does it mean that the religion is actually about? I mean, could you imagine, right? Like imagine if everyone who was religious in this country and the world was like, who we define our religion is by, you know, helping all the widows and orphans. And, you know, that was one of the coolest things when we moved up here to where the little town we live in now. First month we moved up here, it snowed eight inches. <laughs> we had signed up, you know, to get to know more people at the church. We'd signed up for this serve day and there was eight inches of snow on the ground. And we're like, is this thing still happening? And they're like, oh Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure. And before I know it, I'm on the top of this uh, foster mom's roof, repairing the roof in eight inches of snow, man. <laughs> and I'm freezing my butt off. And it's me and this other guy who's now a close friend of mine. And we're just like repairing this woman's roof after this uh, wind and snowstorm. I was like, yeah, this is what it's about. Like, this is, this is it. That was like one of the coolest mystical experiences ever. And it was like with a ladder and a, and a power drill. <laughs> I think people are really hungry for spirituality today. The Eastern philosophies are very attractive because I think they offer a really accessible on-ramp for that stuff. In some degrees, I've only you know, explored the whole Buddhism thing to a degree, but man, the, um, the Spanish mystics and the idea of like more the Christian mystics is sort of like a more, you know, it is in a way its own Eastern tradition that's sort of slowly percolated out west i think the key differentiator is that that sacrifice and that you kind of have to have a cultivation of self to then be able to invest it i think that's a central tenet of of all religions right uh is is that element of sacrifice and it's i I would i would say that might be a central tenet of just life itself i i love that yeah i think where i've arrived with this the book that people think is historically the oldest book that's canonized in the in the bible is the book of job right which is the story where this guy he's actually a good dude kind of tries to answer the question why do bad things happen to good people he's from the land of ooze modern day uzbekistan crazy to think Mm -hmm. about right like so this guy's not even jewish right he's not even a hebrew why is he canonized in the bible right and in the very end you know after he goes through all these trials and his friends are kind of making fun of him and asking him like what he did wrong to deserve this he's like i don't think i did anything wrong to deserve this you know this is you know something else is going on here god says he righteously and justly suffers right he doesn't like feign the name of god and then there's this fascinating part at the end where god's like hey your friends 
they didn't speak correct of me. That's not the way the world works, the way your friends are talking. But if they come to you and you intercede on behalf of them, right? Like I'll accept your prayer. And it's like, whoa, that's interesting. Suffering and sacrifice on our own behalf can grant us the power of intercession for others, right? And there's a lot of people I think that I've seen, and I used to be one of these people that was like, yeah, I got to sacrifice for myself, right? I got to sacrifice for me, right? And you even talked about this, like with your kid, it's like, once you see other people need sacrifice in order to, to sustain and exist, that intercession component, I don't, I think that's something that's maybe lost on, at least in the modern Western English speaking culture, we've lost sort of that way of talking about interceding on behalf of others and and yeah sacrificing for other people yeah it's like that that old saying it's um you don't sacrifice because you love you love because you sacrifice and on that note how has your experience these first nine months or so of your firstborn's life what surprised you what scared you what makes you want eat more kids what makes you (laughs) want to stop it for this one the fears, the doubts, yeah. the joys, all that. However, yeah, however many God will give me, I'll take them. You know, I, I think this is in in Spanish. We don't we don't celebrate birthdays. We celebrate cumpleaños, right? It's the completion of the year, and we I, I think it's more in our language that life doesn't begin at birth. I I did not fully understand that. Um, from my own culture until my wife was 12 to 13 weeks pregnant. We went and did one of these like 3D ultrasounds because we wanted to know if he was going to be a, a, a boy or a girl before we were about to go to Mexico. We were going to go see my mom and then go uh, visit some family in Mexico. Um, and I was like, you know, I'd really want to know because I would love to name him and then make the announcement to all the family in person. And when they did the 4D ultrasound, you know, we're we're all kind of talking and like, I can tell he's responding to my voice. He gets like really happy. He's grabbing at his toes. He does this now at eight months, right? Out, out of the womb. But like his personality had already, was already in there, right? And that's like one of these great mystical things that like, again, it's like you don't know it until you experience it. But I was like, oh man, this is what like God means. It's like you were at the beginning, like these, these all of us are like, not just like sacks of meat, but like a, a spirit that has existed, right? That already has personality and Mm -hmm. experiencing watching my son in the womb, holding his feet, kind of rocking back and forth, doing this like baby yoga, excited to hear my voice and and my wife's voice. And then when we stop, he stops and we start talking again, he's getting stoked again. I was like, whoa, that's, I mean, that's crazy. Take him down to Mexico. We're at um, my cousin's wedding. Mariachis are playing. My wife goes, he is kicking to the beat. He's on beat. Feel this kid. Mm-hmm. Right. And I like put my hand on on her. And I'm like, wow. Like this kid is, and they even said that like, they're like, yeah, they can hear all the sounds. They'll know the voices. They'll know the music. Right. Like I play those same mariachi songs and the kid lights up as though like that's his favorite song from the last, you know, millennia. It's crazy. Um, I'll tell you what, like we, you know, we talk about rite of passage. David Perel, who found a rite of passage, who runs that course, uh, you know, it really has this like bent about like you know we we've kind of lost our rites of passage in you know RIT. Yes, we've lost a lot of those in our modern culture. I think about up here in the in the Great North, right? Like these kids have rites of passage of like when they get their first gun, when they go on their first hunt, when they get their first animal really salt of the earth people up here in sort of the non-denominational church that we're part of now we do this sort of more jordan river baptism full immersion thing and it's like self-select you gotta you know uh you gotta say you want to do it and you want it and then you know the pastor of the church sort of makes it happen right and i just can't wait for for my son to hopefully one day you know walk that path and it would it would bring me a lot of joy to watch him choose sort of that path of honors and, and, you know, whether it's in the Catholic church or in the Protestant church, um, choose to pursue that sort of uh, public declaration of faith. And just watching that this past weekend, Easter weekend with uh, this uh, young woman who I uh, somewhat know her dad and her family and the joy that is with these families when, um, which isn't the story all over the world. Right. But here, that public declaration is like, um, it's that rite of passage. 
like, ah, cool, you're committed to this like group of people. You're a part of this family, this bigger family that for us has been huge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would really look forward to um, hopefully one day uh, being able to see my own son uh, sort of walk that path. That's beautiful, man. Um, you're you're kind of I'm not gonna say just getting started, but you're at the beginning stages of this new journey. What are your what are your plans? But more importantly, like what are you afraid of? I'll say off the bat because what I'm about to I guess say I feel like can be very uh, heavy, but I I would say I have a lot of peace. Um, and my wife and I don't really worry about a lot. We're very fortunate that we're able to solve a lot of our financial needs through our time living in the Bay Area. We invested well, managed our own portfolios, and reflection of moving here, you know, to lower cost of income place. We've been very fiscally conservative. So not a lot of worries there uh, with the faith stuff and the mysticism stuff. My wife and I are on the same page there. There's a lot of peace there. Very fortunate that our son is healthy. Uh, so we're very, we're very blessed. We're very fortunate. And there's much gratitude to be had. I think what I'm, what worries me is seeing what's happened throughout Mexico's history. We talked about Latin America. So what does that mean, right? It's like republics aren't given. You need a polis, a people that want to be participants in a republic and a democracy. You know, the famous Ben Franklin quote, you're a republic if you can keep it. And just seeing the division in our nation, especially having lived in the Bay Area, where I think that division was more uh, vocal and amplified than anywhere else I've seen in the country. You know, watching a lot of the media that's out there, you think about the algorithms that are designed to feed you stuff that, you know, sort of preys on that fear or worry. That's why I don't have any social media on my phone. Things that are false, hearing about them aren't going to change. But what I've been curious to dive into, uh, mostly complete works of Cicero hmm. and sort of like his writings right on the precipice of the fall of the Roman Republic. There's this quote, Cicero says, the ways of our elders produced excellent men and these excellent and eminent men preserve the Republic. But like now, what have we done with these values, right? They're not only no longer practiced, but they're entirely forgotten. Something to that effect. I'm kind of live translating from the Latin, but reading that quote last year really haunted me because I was like, we don't talk about their, this, this way of the elders, the Mas Maiorum in, in Latin in, in the Roman era. And it's so funny because even when I'm back in Mexico, my family, we speak in Spanish, but we have these Latin idioms that we still say, right? Like panamets of census, right? Bread and circuses as we know it in English, right? But it's like, that's an idiom that's 2000 years old and it means something. It's actually a really terrifying thing when you're looking at your society and going, you know, panamets of census. It's not a good thing. And uh, so I've been working on this book. It's called The Mas Maiorum for Modern Man. Um, if you follow my sub stack, you'll be the first to know when it releases. Taking these, these 10 qualities, these 10 attributes, kind of in a Jordan Peterson meets Jocko Willing sort of style. But let's dive into the Latin stuff and go, what actually held together Rome for almost a millennia? You know, um, because we, you know, going back to the United States, like we haven't been a republic for even a quarter of that. You know, we talk about the fall of Rome, and it's like Rome. Rome has the the high score on the on the board right now, right? And we may not make it to uh, anywhere near that if we don't have a polis and a people that actually wanna wanna do this thing. You know, and I think the people who do want to do this thing don't even know how it's supposed to be done, right? Or or, or what were some inspirational you know, ways to, to pursue this experiment of, of freedom and liberty and equality, you know, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, you know, that sort of Adams and Jefferson line, right? Those guys were steeped, steeped in the Latin and Greek, you know, authors of, of the old republics, right? And democracies. Uh, it's not so self-evident, like Cicero said 2000 years ago. And now today, it's like, it's not, it's not evident anymore. We talked about these 10 ideas, discipline, consistency, and gravitas or magnanimity, right? Like when was the last time you talked to someone about magnanimity? I would struggle to define it if I hadn't been working on it in a book for the last six months. Then, you know, talking about religion, culture, and piety. Oh, well, we talk about religion. We talk about culture. We've talked about spirituality or this piety, but those actually need to become integrated things. Oof, that's scary. We've divorced them from each other, right? And then these last four points, virtue, right? When we talk about a woman's virtue or a man's virtue, right? That's Victorian. We haven't touched that stuff in a hundred years. Welcome to the sixties, right? Summer of love. We don't talk about fidelity, right? Like we talk about our infidelities and we're infidels. It's, 
it, it what like we're backwards on this stuff and then like dignity and authority when was the last time we talked about dignity outside of victim culture when was the last time we talked about authority as a positive and like prestigious desirable thing for the service of our fellow man cicero said it's like not only are these values not even practiced they're forgotten entirely right and so i want to like try to breathe some air into those things i don't have all the answers i think hopefully sort of plating the meal with these 10 values talking about some of the old stories from from that sort of greco-roman history and then bringing it forward and talking about you know some of the the modern implementations of these things to that point though I think the importance and the validity of this particular message at this particular time, because I don't think we're going to lose our republic tomorrow, but I do think if we don't change course today, I don't think we're as cognizant of the trajectory of what we have and what we want to have um, as individuals in our nation. And I, and I think that goes for, for both the United States and Mexico. You know, I, I don't, reside in Mexico. I spend a lot of time down there, but so maybe I don't even, I shouldn't even comment on it because I think the the Mexican populace to a degree is, is very smart and should be given a lot of credit. But I think putting these 10 values on the table and saying, let's consider these and let's, let's connect the dots to the modern era. And, you know, kind of like what I was talking about with the Bible, it's like, what does this mean for us today? What does this mean for me today? Why is this applicable? And how do I apply this to my life and my society today? What can I, what can I have a vision for? And I think that's, you know, when you talk about something that worries me or whatever, it's like, do I have a vision of what the United States of America looks like for my great grandkids? When I think about my great grandparents, you know what they were doing? My great grandparents were literally from Mexico and they signed up for the military in the United States and went off to Japan to go make sure there was still a United States for my generation. That was a very clear call to action. I think right now we're sort of in a fog of war ambiguity of what the clear call to action is to still have a republic. So I think highlighting these values and really going, hey, let's meditate on these things. Let's contemplate these things because I, I want to still have a republic. There's plenty of places you can go in the world where you don't have a republic and you don't have your God-given rights protected by the government. You don't have what the Romans called a res publica, a government of the people. And we, uh, to probably the best degree in modern history, have something close to that. And uh, it's worth trying to keep it. It's old, hmm. old Ben Franklin would say. So that's the here, thing here, man. On. Yeah, here, here. And you said you've been working on that book for six months. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, been slowly coalescing over the last six months, and I got probably about three more months until the formal announcement. But uh, I think we'll start pre-orders at the end of June. I think the digital copies. I hope to get out by the end of summer. That's uh, that's awesome, man. Big props to you. I can't wait to. Uh, I can't wait to read it. Man, I really appreciate it. This was this was amazing. Love to do another chat. Yeah. We gotta, we, I mean, we got to talk about history. We got to talk about parenting. We got to talk about business building. We got to talk about creating photography. We, I mean, we just got to go to Mexico together. That's the real deal. That's that's pretty much needs to happen. Yeah. So, what could uh, where can people find you online? Yeah, uh, StephenFoster.substack.com is my Substack. I write there weekly. I've been doing my library notes where you can kind of get a peek into what I'm reading and researching here in the. In the studio that is actually ending this week to give way for what I'll be writing during Rite of Passage. And then following uh, May, going into June of this year, uh, I'll have a whole new series coming out on the Substack. Um, so if you like reading interesting things about Spanish mysticism, spirituality, a um, little bit of history, definitely I'll see you there. Uh, if you like photography and sort of the responsible use of, of technology and, and all these cameras we got, go uh, check out my YouTube, Stephen Foster, Stephen with a V. And um, yeah, tons of fun videos on there. I've been doing YouTube now for two and a half years. So I think I'm close to around 150 videos, photography, tech stuff. It's a fun place to hang out. All right, brother. I appreciate it. Everybody check out Steven's stuff. Check out the show notes and we'll see you next time.